Today I'm talking about my Xbox 360 that I recently hard modded with the reset glitch hack. And it's a very recent modification, specifically some of the breakthroughs that have happened with it. This is one that's evolved over time. And I thought, you know what? It's finally time to sit down and unlock an Xbox 360 that I've had laying around for a while. Partially because MVG did make it look very appealing in his video. But also, there was something else that I wanted to really explore in the Xbox 360 ecosystem. One that's kind of of a time that's passed at this point. But it's, a lot of that stuff has been preserved. And, well, really at this point, the only way I'm going to experience some of it is by hacking a system. So, that's what we're going to do today. Guys, if you enjoy this video, make sure that like button, subscribe if you're new, and we'll start today with this video sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Factor. I've been using Factor for years now to skip the grocery store line with fresh, never frozen meals delivered straight to my door. It's easy. Simply choose from a menu of over 35 weekly flavor packed meals with options including Calorie Smart, Vegan and Veggie, Keto, and more. The Calorie Smart option is great for anyone looking to be mindful of calories heading into the summer season with each meal around 550 calories calories or less. It only takes two minutes for a factor meal to come together, and that's my favorite part. I end up saving a lot of time, and I don't have that what-do-I-eat-for-lunch feeling anymore that really just ends up with you ordering out. Oh, and by the way, Factor will actually end up saving you money over ordering out in the long run. This way, I can eat a delicious meal with my goals in mind, and also, cleanup is a breeze. If you're looking for more convenience throughout your day, check out the assortment of add-ons with quick breakfast items, grab-and-go snacks, smoothies, and more. You can decide how how much you need with their flexible plans and you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code spawnway50 to get 50% off your first factor box and free wellness shots for life. Two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you are an active subscriber. That's factor75.com or click the link below and use code spawnway50. Thanks again to Factor for sponsoring today's video. So let's start with exactly what the reset glitch is. It's a hardware mod that allows you to run unsigned code by sending reset pulses to the processor during post. We're actually able to trick the system into a valid check for the bootloader, even with a modified loader that we put in its place. This has improved over time, and the community has been able to more pinpoint the timing to where it's extremely consistent and fairly quick on startup before it was touch and go if it would actually kick into your custom dashboard. Not really the case anymore. It's really impressive stuff with what the modding community has been able to accomplish despite some, I'll say some pretty serious roadblocks being put up in place by Microsoft during the Xbox 360 generation. But the ultimate goal here is to have the system appear to start like normal, but end up booting into a custom OS with all of your games and homebrew, so let's get to it. For this project, I am using an Xbox 360 Slim, mostly because it's more reliable than the original white model, which, I mean, Red Ring, That there's a lot going on there that makes me concerned about spending the time and, and money and everything around going into a modification like this. Uh, it's also quieter, has built-in Wi-Fi, and I do think it looks better, just in general, and the RG3 mod is apparently more reliable on the Slim, although I haven't tested it myself with compare since I, I can't really verify that firsthand. Tearing one of these down does bring back memories as I have worked on hundreds of these systems in the past. They're slightly more annoying, I'd say, to tear down than the original Xbox 360, mostly due to some of the clips and placements that Microsoft had here holding the shell together. And then also that faceplate ribbon cable. Not really a fan. Usually, though, when I would open these up, I just had to fix the laser. It was very rare to have to go down to the board level and work on the APU or the south bridge. Not really like the old Xbox 360, where it was very common to get one in and then have to go down to the board to work on the GPU. <laughs> with the system down to its motherboard, I do have to come up with a flasher for this. And this is another breakthrough that's happened pretty recently, where we would be using the Raspberry Pi Pico. There's an image that you flash to it, which mostly just has you plug in the Raspberry Pico with the button held down, and then you just drag and drop this UF2 file onto it, and that's it. But what's really cool is it will now be able to read and write the NAND to the Xbox 360. All of this was fairly easy to set up, and really the, the Pico has become sort, sort of a, a, I would say, a cornerstone now in a lot of the console modding community. I've used it on the GameCube, the Wii U, and now we're going to use it on the 360. I feel like this is the part where many people will start to kind of check out of this modification, as we do have to break out 
the soldering iron. Yeah, a lot of this will be temporary as we mostly just need two wires on the underside of the motherboard that have to kind of stay with the system when you close it up. But there will be a lot of temporary stuff, mostly to read and then write the NAND, which this is very dependent on the type of motherboard and then variation you have of that board. So, for example, I have a Corona and... When I started to put this together, I, I didn't realize I had a 4 gigabyte model. So that has 4 gigabytes on board. Others didn't have this. So you definitely want to plug in and check what your storage is before you tear it down. Because I didn't necessarily think I had a 4 gigabyte system because I didn't see it on the board. But they did also build it into like the flash and stuff on the other side. Anyway, I started to wire up normally for a Corona without the 4 gigabyte chip, and it didn't work. I wasn't able to identify the board. I was getting bad readings from the NAND, and after I realized that I did have a 4 gigabyte, I then moved some of the wires around, and it worked out. For the Pico, I did add some headers to it. I figured, hey, if I have headers just kind of set up in the certain spots on the Pico, and I can just kind of plug in cables, this can sort of just be left as an Xbox 360 flasher, just in case I want to do more of these down the road. Oh, and I did mention the two wires on the bottom of the board, which is an, a significant improvement over where we were before with some of the earlier iterations of this glitch, because we needed a chip to just kind of stay behind in, in the system. So you would have to go out and buy basically a proprietary one that was designed for this. Whereas now I needed two wires. One did have a resistor in between, sort of in series here. But for the most part, the two points that I went with for one wire was pretty straightforward. They're smaller, yes, but it's still not the worst thing. However, the other wire, that got a bit more dicey, mostly because one of the points is actually underneath of the silk screen, so you have to scrape away at it. And in this case, I just used a blade and carefully, carefully scraped away at the top just so I could get some of that like copper exposed. I also did use a scope just so I could kind of zoom in and see a bit better because I'm really without it. It'd be incredibly difficult. So this is not going to be a beginner level modification. Just kind of be aware of what you're getting into. Even on certain tutorials and, and images and things you see, it doesn't look so bad. When you're faced with it though, in front of you with an X-Acto knife in hand, it's going to be daunting. But my best advice is don't put too much pressure on the blade. Again, you're just trying to scrape away some of the top part and take your time. It's not a race or anything. And as soon as you start to see some of that copper, hit it with some flux and see if the solder sticks. If it does, you're good to go and you can kind of stop there. Anyway, after getting all the cables set up, everything plugged in, it detected, I was able to pull matching NAND. So you want to pull the NAND twice, compare them as long as everything matches up correctly, we're good to move forward. The rest of the process has to do with writing Zell to the NAND, which allows you to then boot up into a menu that shows you your CPU key on screen. You then use that key, which I had to manually punch that in because I didn't have it plugged in through Ethernet at the time. And that will then allow us to essentially unlock, write the NAND, and once we push it back to the board, will let us load our custom OS. I made all of that sound a lot easier than it really is. I mean, honestly speaking, it took a bit longer than I would like to admit, mostly because I, I misidentified the board necessarily with the whole four gig thing. But even beyond that, it is sort of touch and go still with the using the, the Pico for this. I know there are other flash, like USB flash uh, boards that people use, but it is nice if the Pico works for you because they're cheap. And generally speaking, you may already have one laying around if you've already done certain projects. But now I get to put the system back together, of course, using some new thermal compound since the old compound was thoroughly dried out, X clamp back on, screws together, everything else. And we can start moving over our custom OS. I think what I'm going to do is leave some links down below in the description for people who want to try this themselves, especially when it comes to getting some of these files onto your Xbox 360. This video is not meant to be a guide, just more or less my thoughts on the entire process itself. But at this point, it's mostly about moving files from your PC to the Xbox 360 and then just undergoing a bunch of button prompts and confirming and then pointing out different paths for your, your hard drive. In this system, I do have a 320 gigabyte internal drive, and I figured that would be plenty of space for what I'm looking to do with it, but I mean, I've seen people go like terabytes of size in their Xbox 360, but after I was able to move over the, the files for Aurora, I was then able to boot into it, and I have to say, 
This is a very clean looking custom OS. I did set up an app folder and then also a games folder. Obviously the games folder is where I'm gonna be putting a majority of the, the content, but this allows the system to more or less scan each directory and then present you with a pretty nice layout when it comes to cover art. They have entire synopsis around the things. You apparently get game video previews and stuff that will load up when you go to the game, which in order to save these games to your hard drive, which you could technically do that with the Xbox 360 stock, but you still need the disc to be in the drive. In this case, after you rip it to the hard drive, you don't need it anymore. You can just put it back up on the shelf. And I know people are also obviously downloading a lot of these game files, but in order to rip it from the disc drive, it's not as I would say straightforward as what we see with something like the original Xbox where you put a game disc in and you hit a button with a program and it just starts ripping it and that's it. In this case, you have to manually make the game folder and then go into the DVD drive with all of the files, highlight everything, and then legitimately just copy it to the folder you created in the games directory. And then you just sit there and wait. I mean, it's still not bad. It's just not as dressed up and I guess streamlined as other modified systems that I've seen. But at the end of the day, it does get the job done. You know, the first game that I ripped for the Xbox 360 was a FromSoft game. Had to go that route. And that's Ninja Blade. I don't, I don't know if anyone's played this before. Only on Xbox. It's not backwards compatible. It's still just stuck on the 360. And it's, uh, it's an odd outing for FromSoft. I mean, it was before they really got moving with things like Dark Souls and, and that sort of thing. Um, it was kind of like a Ninja Gaiden clone but the first thing that happens in the game is a quick time event that you can very easily fail because they have timings in fact difficulty settings around some of these quick time events and as you goes through you're gonna see more and more and more of them it is uh an odd game but one that i think is worth at least trying and seeing what you, what you think i'm not gonna say it's a great game We'll just leave it at interesting. I went through and started ripping a bunch of 360 games as well as original Xbox games because there, there's a, a basically a compatibility list that was put out there that starts to whitelist original Xbox games to use the emulator that Microsoft made that normally were not compatible with the Xbox 360. So naturally I went through, started grabbing a bunch of them and and it's kind of neat. You have really this nice carousel that's presented as soon as you turn on the system. And you can pick between Xbox 360, original Xbox, or the real reason that I went through and did this modification, Xbox Live Arcade Games. This was... A moment in time that I don't know if we're ever going to necessarily see again. We have the entire indie scene, which I think is really cool. But at this time, it felt very new and fresh to have a lot of these even larger companies show up with very experimental projects. Uh, smaller bite-sized games, yes. Ones that are also heavily licensed and have been delisted completely. And then, of course, we've seen the Xbox 360 basically become legacy to Microsoft and then completely move away from its storefront. Fortunately, though, the internet backed up a lot of these Xbox Live arcade games, and you can essentially go on Internet Archive, start pulling them, and putting them on your reset glitch-hacked Xbox 360, which is something I started to do because I wouldn't mind going back through some of these and maybe even doing a video as I sort of highlight some of the, the really interesting and impressive games, and then even some of the terrible games or things that went wrong with remakes at this time. Really, it was a, a wild, wild West then uh, when it comes to what was being dropped in the Xbox Live arcade section. Of course, I had to load up Project Bean, or I guess as most people would call it, GoldenEye Remake, the one that was canceled seemingly at the finish line. Well, guess what? It works great here. It's really as easy as putting it on a USB stick and just copying it over to the hard drive and then launching it. I noticed that the Aurora pulls cover art and it's just the GoldenEye 007 <laughs> artwork there, but Sure, why not? We'll go with that one. Anyway, this is still a really cool thing to see on an original Xbox 360 console. You can jump between the newer visuals and the older visuals with the press of a button, and the dual analog setup and controls, for the most part, work really well here. So it's something really fun to kind of just have here, and something also unfortunate because... What could have been? Imagine this with online play on the Xbox 360 back in the day when it was supposed to come out. It would have been something special. I didn't really check out any of the emulators, no homebrew programs. The thing I've noticed with the Xbox 360, it doesn't have the same support from the homebrew community, the modding community, like the original Xbox does. And in fact, it sounds weird to say this, but if you had the option, I would mod an original Xbox and use that for 
certain emulators and and that sort of thing. I think with the 360, it has not been as approachable as the original Xbox because in order to get the most out of the 360, you have to hard mod it. You could flash the DVD drive at the time for the 360. That was mostly to play burn games. To really open up and unlock it when it comes to the OS level, you got to do things like have a chip soldered in for the older reset glitch hack, or even what I showed you here today where you're scratching off parts of the motherboard and moving wires around and running to a, a, a Pico. It's it's not something that is comparable to the original Xbox where you're mostly running an exploited save file. And in this case, that's not even required anymore. So it's no wonder that the community behind the original Xbox is just so much larger. That said, if you feel like you're up to the task with the, the hard mod side for the reset glitch hack, I completely recommend doing it. I think it's a really cool device once it's opened up like this. And the fact that, yes, you can store a lot of your games on the 360, play Xbox original games that weren't backwards compatible, and there are still many 360 games that are kind of just left on the device and were never made backwards compatible for the Xbox series. There's still a lot of stuff to explore here, especially if you're someone who kind of missed out on that generation. And the Xbox Live arcade days... That's something I'm going to be definitely checking out here in the coming weeks. But let me know what you guys think about all this down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.